हेलो नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट इन यू वॉचिंग वैंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा Tonight we lead with India's border standoff with China. Both sides are far from truce. From a truce, uh, latest reports, in fact, indicate that India is sending another 10,000 troops to the China front. Beijing has issued a warning. It says more troops will not ease tensions. We'll tell you how China is trying to twist the narrative here, as its problems with China, in fact, continue. India is also engaging with the Taliban. A top Indian diplomat has met with the Taliban's foreign minister. We'll tell you what signals New Delhi is trying to send here. In the U.S., a combative Joe Biden took on, took on Donald Trump and the Republicans in the State of the Union address. India wants the IMF to watch where its bailout to Pakistan is going. How a weight loss drug, a drug manufacturer, uh, has now become richer than Tesla. And on International Women's Day, we'll tell you why womenomics is the only way forward. We begin with the headlines, as always. In India, big setback to the Congress Party ahead of the general election. Income Tax Tribunal dismisses the party's plea to stop action against its bank accounts. In February, Congress's bank accounts were frozen. The opposition party had alleged that the move was politically motivated. Haiti extends its state of emergency and nighttime curfew. Gang violence has paralyzed the capital. The attacks began a week ago. The prime minister is in Puerto Rico. These armed groups have prevented him from returning to his country. Hong Kong unveils its new national security law. It includes life sentence for offenses like treason and insurrection. The homegrown legislation is Hong Kong's second national security law. The first one was imposed by China in 2020 after pro-democracy protests. In the UK, former Prime Minister Theresa May will not seek re-election. She joins a growing list of conservatives to, to step aside before the uphill election battle. Opinion polls predict. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's party will be defeated after 14 years in power. Taylor Swift is at it again, going on tours and lifting economy. Singapore's GDP likely to expand by 2.9 percent in the first quarter, the highest in six quarters. Why? Because Taylor Swift has brought her era's tour to the country. And Sania Mirza speaks to first post on International Women's Day, talking about her achievements on court and the personal challenges of it. It's a first post exclusive. A lot of people don't know this about me, um, but I have anxiety of meeting new people. Till date, if I walk into a room where my name is going to be announced, and I go to an event, and my name is going to be announced, and I know that everybody is going to turn around and look at me, it gives me anxiety. We start with India versus China. Two neighbors caught in a bitter border standoff, which is now in its fourth year and becoming more tense. All signs point towards rising hostility. India is mobilizing more troops, ten thousand of them. They were stationed on the western border of India, presumably to guard against the threat from Pakistan. These troops are now being redeployed. They'll be stationed along the border with China. So, an additional ten thousand troops at the LAC. Beijing has taken notice, and today it has issued a warning. China says India's increased deployments won't ease tensions. India's strengthened military deployment in the China-Indian border area is not conducive to the efforts made by China and India to ease the border situation, nor is it conducive to the maintenance of peace and tranquility in the border area. So China is trying to paint India as the aggressor, conveniently glossing over how this began. In this equation, India is not the aggressor. India's moves are not offensive; they are meant for defence. They are a reaction to China's expansionism. India has deployed soldiers because diplomacy is not working. These tensions erupted in 2020, and since then, Indian and Chinese generals have met 21 times. So, 21 military-level dialogues and no solution. China has neither withdrawn troops nor shown any inclination to do so. Where does that leave India, with no option but to recalibrate its deployments, to strengthen its defences, and to prepare for the next Chinese provocation? Because the provocation will keep coming. 
So how is India protecting its borders? It's taking a new approach. Increasing troop deployments is just one part of it. India has also built a new fighting command. It's like a combined fighting force with its own artillery and air support. Their assignment is clear cut, guarding a specific part of the border with China. A 532 kilometer stretch, it separates Tibet from two Indian states, Uttarakhand and Himachal Pradesh. But why this particular stretch? It's not clear, New Delhi remains tight-lipped as it practices a strategy of deterrence. As China lines up troops, India responds in kind, matching the scale and numbers. As China ramps up border infrastructure, India does the same. And when you connect these dots, you see the big picture. India is digging in for the long term. Because diplomacy can deliver only so much, especially with a sly customer like China. They only respect the language of strength. And their words do not match their actions. Since 2020, the main sticking points remain unresolved, especially these two friction points, Depsang Plains and Demchok. These are areas in eastern Ladakh. They remain a key source of tension. And China is making it worse by setting up blockades in areas like Kugrang Nala, Gogra Post, and Charding Nala. Fresh clashes have been reported as recently as November 2022 when the Chinese showed up at the Atari post. Indian forces pushed them back. More than 15 Chinese troops are said to have been injured on that day and this happened even as military talks for disengagement were on. Clearly China has not respected the process. And this has compelled India to seek stronger deterrence which brings us to the question what is the current state of deployment? Now, we don't really have the answer to that because neither China nor India has shared the specifics. There are just reports and they're often conflicting. One report says India has 50, 50, 50, 50,000 troops on the China border. Another says there are well over 60,000 troops. Either way, India is adding more troops and this indicates that the situation is precarious. Also look at the statements of top leaders. S. J. Shankar is India's external affairs minister. He spoke about the border situation in January. He said, and I'm quoting, unless there is a firm solution, the forces will remain face to face. Yesterday, he gave an interview and he hinted that the border situation still remains a problem. The Indian Army has the same view. The chief of the Northern Command described it thus. He said the border situation, and I'm quoting, the situation is stable but not normal. And this was said two months ago. So it makes sense for India to be on its guard to keep up its defences and even add more troops. Never say never. It's the simple rule of geopolitics. Always keep your options open. Our next story is the perfect example of that and it starts with a picture. A picture clicked in Kabul yesterday, on Thursday. You can see two men holding official bilateral talks. One is the Taliban's foreign minister. His name is Amir Khan Mutaki. And the other, a senior Indian diplomat. His name is J.P. Singh, a joint secretary at India's External Affairs Ministry. Now, we'll discuss what they talked about. But first, let this picture sink in. A top Indian official engaging with the Taliban's foreign minister. Not sure anyone had this on their bingo card. Now, don't mistake this for recognition. India has not recognized the Taliban regime in Kabul. This is more about engagement. They're reacting to the new strategic reality. But India wants to keep things low-key. Their official statement confirms that. Most of the focus is on the humanitarian assistance. It makes only a passing reference to a meeting with Afghan authorities. Not just foreign, not foreign minister. They only talk, talked about Afghan authorities. It also doesn't reveal the details of what they discussed. India says its approach will be guided by the historical and civilizational ties between the two countries. In other words, India will not abandon Afghanistan. So the Taliban is shouting from the top of buildings because India, after all, is the, the world's largest democracy, the success story of the global south. So the Taliban would love any contact with New Delhi. Now we come to the talks. What did India and the Taliban discuss? This is what the Taliban says. Commending IEA's efforts in ensuring overall security and stability, 
countering narcotics, fighting ISKP, Islamic State of the Khorasan province, and corruption in the country, Mr. J.P. Singh said that India is interested to expand political and economic cooperation with Afghanistan and enhance trade through Chabahar port. Now, two things to note here. One, the Taliban said India has praised its rule, commended its efforts to bring stability and security, and two, India wants to expand cooperation, mainly trade via the Chabahar port. I know these claims may sound a bit dubious, especially India praising the Taliban, but what explains this outreach? Why is India talking to the Taliban at all? For starters, they are the indisputable rulers of Afghanistan. There's no credible opposition left. No scope of foreign intervention in this country. So it looks like the Taliban is here to stay, which leaves the world community with limited options. Secondly, India has interest in Afghanistan. New Delhi has invested some $3 billion in this country. It has made dams, schools and roads. India also has a commitment to the Afghan people. It wants to fulfill that commitment. And for that, it needs a local partner. And right now, there is just one option, the Taliban. Even the United States is doing the same. Their biggest goal in Afghanistan is to check terrorism, to keep the Islamic State under control. So the US too is working with the Taliban, not because they like them, but because they are the only option. Plus, the political dynamics have changed. The last Taliban regime was openly hostile towards India, sort of like a terror launch pad. They stirred up trouble in Kashmir, hosted wanted terrorists. They played along when Indian planes were hijacked. The last Taliban regime. The new Taliban regime seems different. I'm not saying they're better, but they're different. For starters, they're not remote controlled from Pakistan. In fact, this regime is at odds with Islamabad. They also know how valuable India is, whether for investments or soft power or political support. So India is a much bigger prize than Pakistan. Hence the change in the Taliban's attitude. Also, if India does not engage, other countries are ready to do that, like China. In January, Beijing recognized the Taliban regime. It was the first country in the world to do so, to officially recognize the Taliban regime. Xi Jinping accepted the credentials of the Taliban's envoy to Beijing. And China's priority is clear. Exploit Afghanistan's resources. We're talking about a trillion dollar treasure trove. China wants to exploit it. And if India doesn't engage, the Taliban will seek them out. Afghanistan could become another Chinese ally in the region. They're already close. So New Delhi had to do something. In 2022, it deployed a technical team in Kabul. Again, do not mistake this for recognition because the technical team's main job was to distribute aid. And that still has not changed. But as India steps up engagement, it must be mindful of a few things. Number one, the Taliban's foreign policy may have changed, but their domestic policy has not changed. Afghan girls still cannot go to school. They cannot take up jobs. They cannot participate in sports. As a democracy, India cannot be seen to be condoning that. Number two, it sets the bar very low for legitimacy. Just think about it. The Taliban are a bona fide terror group. What have they done to be courted by the world? Absolutely nothing. All they have done is stayed in power. Is that the new benchmark of legitimacy? Will any terrorist or gang leader be recognized as long as they retain power? So India should be mindful of the narrative, of the optics of such meetings. Because this is one place where India has a lot of leverage. You see, New Delhi has that one thing that the Taliban so desperately want. And that is recognition, not from some dictatorship like China, but from a democratic success story. India's job is to use that leverage wisely to force the Taliban to reform its rule and society. If not, history may not be kind to this outreach. Meanwhile, the Taliban's former godfathers are in trouble, or should I say more trouble, just name a problem and Pakistan has it. Economic troubles, check. Political persecution, check. Terrorism and rising debt, check. Tonight, we are talking about that last one. Rising debt. So let's start with some numbers. Pakistan's foreign debt in March 2023 
was $85.2 billion, March 2023. By September, it was $86.4 billion. Now look at the increase in six months. Pakistan added $1.2 billion to its debt in half a year. $1.2 billion in six months. Where did these loans come from? China was the top bilateral source. They lent some $500 million to Pakistan. Saudi Arabia was second with $300 million. Most of this money was used to finance energy imports. Now, Pakistan's pr problem is obvious. On the one side, debt is rising. On the other, the revenue is stalled. They're not making money. So repaying this debt is going to be very tough. Again, let's look at the numbers. Pakistan has to pay back $73 billion by 2025. $73 billion. Out of that, $27 billion has to be paid this year by November 2024. How will they do that? How is Pakistan planning to do that? By taking more loans. Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif has ordered his government to start talks with the IMF, International Monetary Fund. How much money does he want this time? Reports say $6 billion. Now, let me point out two obvious problems here. One, Pakistan doesn't have a finance minister. So who exactly will start these talks? And two, borrowing to repay loans is never the solution. Not unless you make some systemic changes, which, let's face it, Pakistan will not. Islamabad has received 22 loans from the International Monetary Fund. Around half of them were bailouts. Each time, Pakistan promised to make systemic reforms and each time they failed. So why would the 23rd time be any different? Logic says it won't. But tell that to the IMF. They're more than keen on giving more loans. First, they want to review the current loan conditions. But after that, they're open to a new program if Pakistan asks for it. So what about the election rigging? Or the bloated defense budget or the subversion of democracy, does none of it matter to the IMF? From the looks of it, no. India has urged the fund to take note of these issues. India has asked the IMF to take note of all of this. It has asked them to ensure two things. One, the loans are not used to arm Pakistan, basically to fund the military. And two, they are not used to repay other countries. But can India enforce this? I'm afraid not. India's voting share at the IMF is just 2.7%. And usually India abstains from voting on Pakistan's loans. China has a 6.4% share. The US has around 17.5%. And both these countries, America and China, are expected to back Pakistan. But the loan is just one step. What matters is a follow-up. Do you administer the bitter pill? Do you introduce much-needed reforms? That's what matters. Now, Shabazz Sharif is hinting at some of those steps. For example, he wants to speed up the privatization of Pakistan's state carrier, PIA, the Pakistan International Airlines. They want to privatize it. Reports say he set a deadline for that. He wants PIA to be sold off by June 15th. It's a good start on the reform path. But a lot more needs to be done. And to do that, Shabazz Sharif needs a stable polity. He needs peace at home, peace at the borders, and peace inside his alliance. And chances are, he won't get any of it. Their biggest security challenge is the TTP, the tehreek e taliban Pakistan, a.k.a. the Pakistani Taliban. Their goal is to defeat and topple the current regime in Islamabad. That's what the TTP wants. And then replace this regime with an Islamist one. And guess what? Pakistan's army seems scared of them. So much so that they're dragging this issue to the United Nations. Pakistan says the TTP is a global threat. So it wants the UN Security Council to intervene. How? By asking the Afghan Taliban to cut ties with the Pakistani Taliban. The Afghan interim government's failure to control the TTP and other terrorist groups erodes its claim of full control of its territory that it asserts in order to secure international recognition. Mr. President, I am confident that this council will join Pakistan in demanding that the Afghan interim government terminates its relationship with the TTP and its affiliates and prevents them from having free reign to conduct cross-border attacks against Pakistan 
how the times change. Pakistan funded and armed the Afghan Taliban. Now that same group won't help them. Pakistan also lobbied for the Afghan Taliban at the United Nations in the past. Now it wants the United Nations Security Council to act against them. This is a perfect example of why shady policy choices never work. Not in foreign affairs, not in financial growth, and not in domestic politics. Pakistan faces some major trust issues. So does Joe Biden, it seems, the President of the United States. He's standing for re-election this year. But the Democrats, his party, wish that he weren't standing. Nearly half of them. They would like Biden to be replaced with a different candidate. So last night, President Biden tried to change some minds. He delivered what's called the State of the Union Address. This is an annual speech. The President delivers it to the U.S. U.S. lawmakers, and it's an assessment of sorts, of how the U.S. is doing, where the country is heading, the achievements and the challenges. The president talks about all of it, all of it. but this year, it was an election speech. Now my predecessor, a former Republican president, tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. I think it's outrageous, it's dangerous, and it's unacceptable. <laughs> Biden did not leave any room for ambiguity that former Republican president is Donald Trump. The man Biden is likely to go up against. It will be a Trump versus Biden contest in all likelihood in the presidential election. So Biden did not name Donald Trump, but he used the phrase, my predecessor, 13 times. So a large part of his address was dedicated to Donald Trump, and it seemed a lot like a boxing match. Biden had a counter punch for every attack by Trump. You heard his comments about Russia. Trump encouraged Putin to, and I'm quoting, he encouraged Putin to, to do whatever the hell he wants with a NATO ally. Biden called that statement outrageous, dangerous, and unacceptable. He accused Trump of threatening democracy, a reference to the, to the riot on the Capitol Hill, the one that happened three years ago. Trump has been accused of inciting this riot. Biden now says Trump is trying to bury the truth about it. The threat to democracy must be defended. My predecessor and some of you here seek to bury the truth about January 6th. Here's the simple truth. You can't love your country only when you win. The speech had a lot of drama. On immigration, the Republicans tried to heckle Biden. One particular case came up, the death of Lake and Riley. She was a nursing student in Georgia. Last month, she was murdered, allegedly by an immigrant. When Biden spoke about his immigration bill, the Republicans raised Riley's death. Biden tried to respond with some theatrics, but he stumbled. Lincoln, Lincoln Riley, an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal... That's right. But how many of thousands of people being killed by legals? Joe Biden held up a pin with Lake and Riley's name on it and then went on to mispronounce her name. A Republican lawmaker gave that pin to him when he was coming to deliver his speech. What happened next does not bode well for a candidate whose age and fitness are talking points in the election. Despite the slip-ups, Joe Biden tried to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Republicans. There was a lot of back and forth. The tension was apparent, especially when he raised some pressing issues like the military aid package for Ukraine. Ukraine can stop Putin if we stand with Ukraine and provide the weapons that needs to defend itself. History is watching. If the United States walks away, it will put Ukraine at risk. Europe is at risk. The battle lines are clearly drawn, not just between Biden and the Republicans, but also between America and its allies. This is, of course, about the war in West Asia and America's disagreements with Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel. Joe Biden made a key announcement. The U.S. military will build a temporary port on Gaza's Mediterranean coast. This port will be used to transfer aid. But why do they need a port? Because Israel controls access to Gaza and it refuses to allow more routes for humanitarian assistance. So this plan will bypass Israel altogether. As they keep piling the pressure on Netanyahu. Listen to this. Israel must do its part. 
Israel must allow more aid into Gaza to ensure humanitarian workers aren't caught in the crossfire. To the leadership of Israel, I say this. Humanitarian assistance cannot be a secondary consideration or a bargaining chip. Strong words again. Not sure if Netanyahu is listening. A ceasefire still eludes Gaza. Last night, Biden said he was working tirelessly to achieve a six-week-long ceasefire, but negotiations are proving to be difficult. And that was a common thread. Throughout the State of the Union address, this speech was Biden's attempt to recast his image. To show himself as a more combative leader ahead of the election. But it only seemed to have betrayed his shortcomings, his weaknesses as a leader. Donald Trump chose to highlight them on his social media platform. It's called Truth Social. Trump spoke about Biden's problems with Iran, with immigration and with Ukraine. So the gloves are off. This presidential election is shaping up to be a big brawl. Now let's turn our attention to Sweden. Yesterday it became a full-fledged member of NATO, member number 32. After almost two years of waiting, the Swedish flag will finally fly at the NATO headquarters. The country's prime minister is thrilled. This is a historic event for our country. After more than 200 years of non-alignment, Sweden has joined the Western defense community. Together, we become stronger and safer. It is a big step, but at the same time, a natural step. The membership means that we have come home. It says Sweden has come home. But to do that, they had to abandon about 200 years of neutrality. Sweden, along with Switzerland, was known for this neutrality. And like with Switzerland and Nazi gold, neutrality was lucrative for the Swedes as well. The last war they fought was in the early 1800s, some 200 years ago. Since then, no one has directly engaged with Sweden, not even during the two world wars. During World War II, Sweden served as a refuge. Thousands of Jewish people from Europe took shelter in Sweden, as did children from Finland. Sweden could give them sanctuary because no one was attacking it. And the neutrality provided business opportunities as well. Sweden infamously provided iron to the Nazis, helping fuel the German war machine while staying clear of Allied guns. But now it seems neutrality is no longer profitable. Sweden fears that the risk from Russia is too great. Russia's war on Ukraine is too close to home. So in 2022, Stockholm decided to throw its lot with the West. And since then, it has patiently been waiting for NATO membership. That wait ended yesterday, and the Swedes seemed delighted. I think that's feel uh, much safer now. Uh, before we was outside and uh, feel a little bit alone. Now uh, it's safer. For me, it's safer because uh, we are neighbor of Russia. Uh, Finland between, but uh, we need it. Definitely we need it. Russophobia has sent Sweden into NATO's eager arms, but remember this is NATO. As former US President Donald Trump likes to say, they aren't running a charity. Even when a, NATO, when a nation is not paying their fair share, they do bring something to the table. In Sweden's case, it's the domination over the Baltic Sea. This is the Baltic. Sweden dominates it. And now Sweden is part of NATO. So NATO controls the entire region by extension. And Russia has minor outlets here. But the region has effectively been closed off for Moscow. This Nordic wall will deter any Russian ambitions in the Baltic Sea. At least that's what the West hopes for. But painting the map blue was not NATO's only reason for bringing Sweden in. Capabilities, uh, strong air force, uh, submarine competence, uh, uh, intelligence, surveillance. He's talking about some world-class weaponry here. Gripen fighter jets, Gotland-class submarines, Carl Gustav and 84 anti-tank weapons. Sweden is bringing all of this to the table, adding even more lethality to NATO's arsenal. And they promise to pay their fair share too. Last year, Sweden promised to spend more than 2% of its GDP on defense, potentially exceeding NATO's requirements. So no matter how you look at it, this is a win for NATO. But is it a win for Sweden? 
because apart from the business opportunities, there was another advantage to, to neutrality. No nation would ever launch a nuclear weapon at a neutral country. And Sweden knew this. That's why it stuck to neutrality throughout the post-World War II period. But by joining NATO, Sweden risks being targeted in a nuclear first strike. It probably will not happen. We hope it doesn't. But now there's, there's a non-zero chance, which means objectively, Sweden is less, less safe today than it was before. Hopefully the people do not regret their choice. Now to Sweden's Nordic neighbor, Denmark. Do you know what Denmark's GDP is? Around $430 billion. That's the country's GDP, $430 billion. Now look at Novo Nordisk. It's a Danish pharma company. It makes weight loss drugs, Ozempic and Vigavi. Now do you know what Novo Nordisk's valuation is? Around $604 billion. So the Danish company has a bigger valuation than the country's GDP. And it's lifting the country's economy. Last year, Novo Nordisk was Europe's most valuable company. It surpassed the likes of LVHM, the luxury giant that owns Louis Vuitton, Fendi and Dior. Now this year, Novo Nordisk has bigger goals. It has surpassed Tesla. Novo Nordisk has a market cap of $604 billion. Tesla is worth $569 billion. So it is worth more than the EV car maker. I guess Elon Musk is regretting that endorsement now. He endorsed Vigavi for weight loss. And now its makers have beaten Tesla. But what is really driving this rally? A new obesity pill. An experimental drug called amicretin. Novo Nordisk is testing this drug. The phase one trial results are out and here's what they found. In just 12 weeks, participants lost around 13% of their body, we body weight. In 12 weeks, 13% of the weight was lost. Compare that to Vigavi. In 12 weeks, people lose around 6% of their body weight. So the new drug is more potent and that's what drove this surge. Investors cheered the trial results. The market was optimistic. The shares of Novo Nordisk shot up by 8%. They reached a record high. So it's all going very well for the company. And what does it say? It says it's confident of the new drug. It says the development will continue. It could launch this decade. The company will develop two versions, oral and injectable. It says it has more such products in the pipeline and it's not the only company doing this. US-based Ellie Lilly is testing a similar pill. So is another Danish company called Zealand Pharma. After all, the weight loss market is booming. By 2030, it could be worth $100 billion. Celebrities, world leaders, billionaires, they all swear by it. And that means a lot of potential and room for a lot of new players. So there is hype and demand. But is it all good? Let's look at the science here. How do these treatments work? They mimic naturally occurring hormones in your body. This leads to reduced cravings, lower blood sugar. So you feel more full after a meal. You don't eat more, you drop the weight. But it's not so black and white. These drugs have side effects too. In some cases, it's nausea and vomiting. In others, there are long-term effects like low blood sugar, kidney injury, risk of thyroid cancer, Acute pancreatitis, stomach paralysis, gallbladder disease, damage to the eye's retina, depression and suicidal behavior. And our understanding of these side effects is still evolving, so there may be more hidden risks that we don't know about. Plus, these drugs need to be used continuously. If you stop using them, you regain the weight. And most people have gained back most of the weight after they discontinued them. And those who continue using the drugs get addicted. Some have even compared this to opiate addiction. So it's as dangerous as drugs. Then why is it so popular? Because weight loss has become an aspirational pursuit. More than 1 billion people are obese worldwide. That's 1 in 8 people. Weight loss is a new holy grail. People go to all extremes for it. So when a drug offers weight loss, you can understand the hype. And companies are capitalizing on that. That. They talk about the effects, but hardly mention the side effects. They are just making more and more drugs, and these drugs do not even come cheap. By some estimates, you would need some $1.1 million on weight loss drugs to prevent other diseases. 
But Novo Nordisk does not talk about that, which explains why people are lapping up these drugs. Companies just show one side of the story, the side where weight loss happens with just a pill or an injection. The other side is shrouded in secrecy, the side effects, the addiction. It goes without saying that we should all chase health, good health. Obesity does not help anyone. So health should be the ultimate goal. But the problem needs better answers. It cannot be half-baked drugs and companies raking up billions in profits, capitalizing on insecurities of people. Now let's talk about a crisis in India's Silicon Valley. I'm talking about Bengaluru. Investors have been flocking to the city. They're eager to invest in its thriving tech sector. But today, there are long queues for water in Bengaluru. There is an alarming scarcity of water, and this has forced factories to slow down manufacturing activity. The timing couldn't have been worse. Bengaluru is trying to attract major investments in high-value industries such as chip manufacturing. Will this water crisis make investors rethink? Here's a report. Today, this viral post is making waves on social media. It was shared on Reddit. It paints a grim picture about India's biggest tech hub, Bengaluru. The writer is complaining about water scarcity. Apparently, his apartment in a post-gated community has suffered a serious shortage of water. It began over a month back. And with each passing day, the situation is only getting worse. There is talk of residents vacating their apartments and moving to temporary accommodations. Apparently, some residents are using washrooms at gyms and nearby malls. Those who chose to remain were advised to use disposable plates for meals. As of this evening, that post on Reddit was gone. But screenshots of it are being shared across different platforms by a large number of users. Some have disputed these claims, but the conversation hasn't died down. Because that post on Reddit touched a raw nerve. The water shortage in Bengaluru is real. Supplies have dried up from groundwater resources by at least 50%. The crunch has hit all corners of society, from apartments to gated communities, private and government schools, even the industries and the construction sector. The local administration is taking emergency measures. There is a cap now on the price of water tankers, and the use of drinking water is restricted. Using portable water for activities like washing, gardening and entertainment like water fountains can attract a fine. Malls and theatres have been asked to restrict their use of water. The crisis reflects the city in bad light. Bengaluru is known as India's Silicon Valley, one that it wishes to build on. New manufacturing facilities are coming up. Last year, a factory just outside Bengaluru started producing iPhones. Chip manufacturer AMD has built a design centre in the city. The company says the campus is its largest global centre where 3,000 engineers will design and develop semiconductor technology. Companies like HCL have also shown interest. Reports last year claimed that HCL wants a chip unit in Karnataka and has been offered land near Bengaluru. The size of the investment is said to be around $400 million. But problems like water shortage paint Karnataka's capital city in bad light. Because water supply isn't just about sustenance, it also functions as a fuel for manufacturing in many sectors. And such shortages spell trouble for Bengaluru's future prospects. Now we turn to Nigeria, where a tragedy is unfolding. Yesterday, about 287 people were kidnapped. Most of them were children. These children were at school attending the morning assembly when dozens of gunmen descended upon the school. They came on motorcycles and proceeded to round up everyone between the ages of 8 and 15. Some teachers were taken too. One person apparently tried to resist. He was shot dead. Leading the school assembly was kidnapped. The teacher said he could not run away because some students depended on him for protection. He was kidnapped. A vigilante was also killed while he was trying to scare the gunman away by shooting in the air. But he was killed. Reports say one girl was also shot. She is receiving medical attention at a local hospital now. The other victims were taken into the wilderness nearby. The bush, as the locals call it. The villagers are despondent. Please come and help us. Please don't leave us. We have not eaten. Please help us. 
Where is the president? Where is the governor? There are students inside. In one household, seven children were kidnapped, while in another household, five children were kidnapped. The kidnapping took place in Kuriga village. It is located in the Kaduna state. The state's governor went to the site of the kidnapping and he vowed that no child would be left behind. By the grace of God, under my able leadership, we will try as much as possible to ensure that every child returns. That's easier said than done, though. Kidnappings are common in northern Nigeria. In the northwest, you have armed gangs, locally known as bandits. In the northeast, you have terrorists, Boko Haram and its affiliates. Sometimes these groups work together, but they usually have their own areas of control. Yesterday's attack took place in an area controlled by the Ansaru group. It's a breakaway faction of Boko Haram. The Ansaru group is infamous for kidnapping seven foreigners back in 2013. They eventually executed these hostages because the British and Nigerian government tried to rescue them. Which is why a rescue operation may be risky. Whether it's gangs or terrorists, their motive is often the same. They kidnap people and hold them for ransom. Once the ransom is paid, the victims are usually released. The groups then use the ransom money to buy more weapons and vehicles, and then the cycle continues. The kidnapping business is so widespread that Nigeria's government tried to outlaw ransom payments. This was in 2022. Paying ransom now carries a jail sentence of 15 years. But reports say no one has been arrested for paying ransoms, and it continues unabated. So now the Nigerian government either pays the ransom, which is illegal, or they hunt the kidnappers down and risk the hostages getting hurt, which puts the government in a tough spot. But they have to do something, and fast. After a lull, kidnappings seem to be rising again. On Sunday, about 50 people were kidnapped in northeastern Nigeria. Most of them were women who had gone to collect firewood. In January, five sisters were kidnapped in the capital of Buja. Their father was asked to pay a $68,000 ransom to free them. The cycle is becoming an epidemic again and Nigeria needs to nip it in the bud or risk bolder attacks in the days to come. Our next story is about Ramzan, the holy month for Muslims. In India, we call it Ramzan, not Ramadan. It is based on the Persian pronunciation. Well, whatever you call it, the Islamic holy month is about to begin. It commences on Sunday and it is a month of prayer and fasting for Muslims everywhere. But this holy month also brings with it hardships. We've seen crippling inflation in the run up to Ramazan and this has been the case for the past few years. And this year is no different. It has put a dampener on the celebrations in multiple countries. Our next report has more. <laughs> The run-up to Ramzan is always a busy time. People are preparing for the festivities. They are stocking up on essentials, like food for the iftar, the evening meal where Muslims break their fast during the holy month. If you aren't eating all day, you'd like your first meal to be special. But sadly, many across the Muslim world are struggling to arrange that. For sure, I reduced my consumption. If I were buying 5 kilos before, I now buy 2 kilos. The one who used to buy a 30 kilo sack of dates is now getting 10 kilos instead. And the one who were buying 10 kilos is now buying 5 kilos. I am surprised at how all the prices have gone up. Everything, from eggs to cooking oil to even rice, everything has become more expensive. I have trouble even buying rice. Ramzan inflation is bringing the entire world together. Everyone is complaining about the price hikes. There are various reasons for this. Chief, of course, is demand and supply. Demand goes up every year before Ramzan, so sellers hike prices. It's basic economics. But the last few years have been worse than usual. From 2022, the world has been facing unnatural Ramzan inflation. Partially brought about by the war in Ukraine. Ukraine and Russia were major grain exporters. The war has hampered exports and the pinch can be felt in markets everywhere. Though people often don't care much for these explanations. 
When the government cannot control the price, they blame the international market. Do you think people understand or care what the international market is? We shop at local markets. Please don't show us dollar price inflation. Lower class people are struggling to survive. Sometimes the governments are indeed to blame. Take Turkey for instance. It has about 67% inflation. That's because of President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's unorthodox economic policies. They have been crippling Turkey for years. And the people have to bear the brunt. Ramzan inflation is only adding salt to the wounds. Egypt is in a similar situation. Inflation was at about 30% in January. This is because of an ongoing economic crisis. To make matters worse, the Egyptian pound is crashing due to currency devaluation. We told you about this yesterday. This is bound to cause the price of imports to surge, adding to the Ramzan inflation. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, the government is doing what it does best, spending money it doesn't have, hoping to win over the population. Newly reappointed Prime Minister Sheba Sharif unveiled a Ramzan package yesterday. It is worth about $27 million. It aims to reduce the prices of essential items. But the people of Pakistan don't seem convinced. The situation is terrible. I came here with 20,000 rupees, but I haven't been able to buy 20 items. I'm almost crying. The government must consider our plight. Governments know that Ramzan inflation takes place every year, yet they regularly fail to bring it under control. And as a result, every year, the holy month becomes bittersweet for Muslims everywhere. For our last story tonight, let's talk about today. The 8th of March, it's International Women's Day. You must know that by now. Every year this day, women are, are the center of all attention. Whether it's the cheesy WhatsApp forwards, the uplifting campaigns, the rising flower sales, the discounts on beauty brands, the world wants you to know that you are special. But what about the day after? What about, say, March 10th? The flowers rot, the discounts run out, and women are back to normal. And normal in this case is economic inequality. It's a curious phenomenon, really. On one hand, society showers women with flowers, with praise. Your, your resilience is talked about. On the other hand, it systematically undervalues their labor, stifles their careers, and denies them financial security. So this Women's Day, why not try something more sustainable, like womenomics? What does it mean? What is womenomics? It's a term associated with former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. It took off in the 2010s. Japan's economy was struggling. The country had a shrinking workforce. So Abe had a eureka moment. Why not include more women in the workforce? Japan jumped into action. Workplaces were asked to be more accommodating. Daycares were set up. It did not really help. In 2012, women's participation was around 46%. By 2017, it, it rose to some 50%, which is quite low for any developed nations. Most new workers were in low-paying jobs. Only 4% of managerial positions are held by women. So it was a good idea, but Abe's policies did not go far enough. He focused on stopgap measures. The execution was flawed. But the idea itself stuck. And it has merit. Empowering women is smart economics. If women are empowered, economies advance. And I'm not the one saying this. The World Bank is. Here's a new World Bank report. It says closing the gender gap could lift the global GDP by more than 20%. Imagine that, 20%. Basically, women can turbocharge the economy. So what's stopping them? Let me rephrase the question here. Let me reframe it, rather. What's not stopping them? 2.4 billion women do not have the same economic rights as men. 2.4 billion women in the world. In 178 countries, they face legal barriers. Barriers that stop women from working in all the sectors. In 86 countries, women face job restrictions. 95 countries do not guarantee equal pay for equal work. 
Worldwide, women earn only 77 cents for every dollar that a man makes. It's called the gender pay gap. 77 cents for a dollar. Or what some men term as fiction. Take India, for example. At the entry level, women earn 2.2% less than men. And as they move forward in their career, this gap widens. At the level of directors, the gap is around 6.1%. That's a lot for the salaries at that level. 151 countries ban sexual harassment at work, but only 40 ban it in the public. So on paper, women have only two-thirds of the, of the same rights as men. On ground, the situation is much worse. Globally, women spend two and a half to three hours more, two and a half to three hours more every day on unpaid work. That's childcare or household jobs. That is 21 hours every week. If it were assigned a monetary value, it would be more than 40% of a country's GDP. So there's discrimination at work, but it doesn't even stop after retirement. Women live longer than men, yet in some countries they retire earlier than men, which means they get lesser pension benefits. At the current rate, it will take 131 years to reach full gender parity. We are in the 21st century and no country has yet achieved full gender equality. So what is the solution? Closing the gender pay gap can lift the global economy by $7 trillion and that cannot happen without government intervention. Countries need more business opportunities, laws related to women's safety, childcare facilities, lifting restrictions on women's work and expanding maternity and paternity leaves. We need a 360 degree change. Countries need to realize when more women work, economies grow. So this Women's Day, why not combine floral arrangements with financial security? After all, the flowers may wilt and fade, but equal pay is for life. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Greece, students clash with the police as the parliament prepares to vote on a new education bill. In Australia, hundreds of kangaroos invade a golf course. It's another setback for Boeing. A United Airlines plane lost a tire mid-air while taking off from San Francisco. Finally, taking you back in history on this day in 2014, Malaysia Airlines flight MH370 went missing. It was heading from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing. It was carrying 227 passengers and 12 crew members. 39 minutes later, the flight vanished from all air traffic control radar displays. No one knows what happened to this flight. Till date, it's one of the biggest aviation mysteries of this century. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. Okay, I'm going to do a small intro and then I'll start off. Answer to your question is no, I didn't think so. <laughs> There's so many things that go along with it. The first thing that we are judged on is the way that we look. Oh my God. How you said hi to someone and why you said hi like that. And there are so many people looking up to you and so many kids wanting to do what you're doing or be like you. The obsession we have also with men. I mean, Salman Khan has still asked when he's going to get married. Exactly. So it's not a woman issue. So this came from the heart. <laughs> <laughs> I think when we walk into a room, the first thing that we are judged on is the way that we look. How I'm sitting with you when this camera is not rolling is very different to how I sit with you when the camera is rolling. But I have anxiety of meeting new people.
you know i mean a lot of people don't know this about me um but i have anxiety of meeting new people can you believe that like i mean and the way my life turned out and panned out till date if i walk into a room where my name is going to be announced my go to an event and my name is going to be announced and i know that everybody is going to turn around and look at me it gives me anxiety like it you know so i have never really spoken about this so imagine from a person like that like in school i used to know the answers to every single question but i never put my hand up because i didn't want people to turn and look at me oh my god <laughs> because i had anxiety from it you know i was like oh my god everybody is going to look at me and like and i knew i had i knew the right answer so that's the person that i really am and then my life turned out the way that i did where i became this public speaker and i you know so i've actually had to train myself to become this person but how does it work when you get on a tennis court then i mean because everyone's watching you your skills are being judged are being so judged. at that moment actually when i play tennis is when i'm the most fearless um and honestly none of that mattered when i walked onto the tennis court when i walked onto the tennis court it didn't matter to me what people said what people did what people whether they watched or they didn't watch for me um the, uh, like playing and trying to win and being the best version of myself out there trumped everything else and that that is the only time i didn't feel that ang- anxious energy like where i would be like oh my god i'm going to walk on the court and people are going to look at me i didn't care But if you tell me to walk into a restaurant till date i swear to you if i have to go to a restaurant that is in this part of the world where i know for a fact that i will get recognized it gives me i'm not saying it gives me anxiety where i won't enter the restaurant but it gives me butterflies in my stomach where i'm like oh my god i have to enter this restaurant it is of it's almost like a thing that i fight with on a daily basis within my system so are you also embarrassed with compliments you're very very like i'm so bad anybody that knows me like the when they start complaining i'm like stop talking about me i'm resting right here like don't talk about me so uh, th- that also comes from that right that's a personality trait also because it's like connected to this so i don't like compliments at all i would like to say that the the moment i became number 1 in the world and uh, i mean it's a very hard choice to make because there were a lot of moments where i felt that but i think that when you become number 1 in the world at what you do um, and what you've dreamt of all your life i mean i remember times when you know there were a lot of kids in my school we used to play tennis there was like six kids i think in my class alone and um, we used to sit and talk and and i was always a little better than everybody else you know when i was playing and um, i remember sitting and having conversations with like and we were writing those you know you used to get those note that you used to friends used to exchange with these friendship like the yeah, books yeah, yeah. i don't know what they even slam called books. yeah like slam books and you used to write what's your dream and you're like i want to be number 1 in the world at tennis and all six girls used to write that you know and i used to write that too and that's really a memory that flashed by me when that happened so it is literally a dream that comes true for very very few people to being number 1 at what they do at anything any career that they choose so yeah i would say that moment probably rights and wrongs and do's and don'ts for women are a lot more than they are for men and uh, no matter what a woman is achieving in their uh, career or, or whatever path they've chosen i feel that in society they are truly uh, Sweden has officially joined the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It became the 32nd member of NATO after completing its accession process in Washington. Following this, Swedish Prime Minister Ulf Kristersson hailed the country's membership in the alliance. He said that unity and solidarity would be Sweden's guiding lights. This comes 2 years after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which forced Sweden